What's up, guys? This is Alex Van Houten with Defining Dad Bod. I hope you're doing well. I'm here with two amazing people, and I'm excited to talk about the idea of practical strength. You can find Dave and Sarah at Practical Strength on Facebook. Dave and Sarah, how are you doing today? Great. Yeah, yeah, we just had a great conversation about teenagers versus young kids and stuff. And I just want to let the viewers know some of you have teenagers and you've laughed at me talking about my, my little three year old. They burst my bubble hard and telling me that this doesn't get any easier. You just get better and then your kids get more challenging. Is that about right? Is that a good summary of that our is absolutely accurate? There is no question. So so thanks, guys. Thanks for the progressive overload conversation. That's going to be fun. But uh, we're not here to talk about parenting, or at least not specifically today. We're here to talk about practical strength. And so I want to give you guys an opportunity to introduce yourselves and your backgrounds because you're both fascinating individuals with a deep passion for developing the foundational ability of strength, not just physically. It sounds like there's a mental and spiritual component to this as well with the clients that you've worked with in your, your time frame in the industry. But Dave, let's start with you. Tell me about where sure. you come from and uh, why you're so passionate about this. It's a huge question. I'll try to compress it. My background uh, actually came out of motorsports as a kid. Uh, my father was a professional motorcycle racer growing up, so that the rhythm of uh, train compete was always just part of my life. Uh, I got into uh, high-level athletics, racing, mountain bikes, road cycling, velodrome at a reasonably high level in my early 20s. I was a pro mountain biker for several years and raced at an okay level. I got, I got my butt kicked by really talented people is probably the best way to put it. And I actually had some really bad injuries in my late 20s, early 30s that took me out of the sport for about two or three years. And that put me back into the gym, working on just sort of getting myself back together. I had uh, worked as a massage therapist for a number of years, so I had a background in just sort of understanding the body, which I then applied to the process of just trying to fix myself. Fell in with the right crowd, I guess, in strength training, probably the best gym north of Sacramento, uh, Seattle Strength and Power in Seattle, Washington, mm -hmm. and immediately just fell in love with the process of getting strong again and developed a practice of my own and sort of my own philosophy of how to take yourself from zero back to whatever you're capable of at that point in your life. Competed at a, the highest amateur level you can in uh, Highland Games, strongman powerlifting. <laughs> I mean, it's as a master's athlete, that's not uh, super impressive. So I see myself in, in context of some great, you know, trained alongside pro strong men and alongside, you know, 70, 80 year old women who are competing in the IPF. And I really see that as the, it's the same thing. It's just a continuum and understanding the process from somebody who's 13 years old to somebody who's 93 years old. There's no fundamental difference other than the capabilities that they bring with them and the workarounds that you need to do. That's probably why I'm passionate about it is because I had to take myself back from zero several times, probably three or four times. <laughs> so it's a process I enjoy. It is absolutely a mental process that physically you bring whatever gifts you bring to the table. To me, that's a bit irrelevant. It's more what's the hardware up here that lets you get from A to B and the process, the visible signs of progress that I think are super important to people as they go over the story arc of their life whether you're raising kids or whether you're just starting out or whether your kids are leaving the house or whether you're transitioning into retirement, that is all one big process of change that takes a lot of mental hardware and having the right outlets can tune a position to thrive in it rather than to go through it. I love that, man. Quite the superhero origin story, actually. So before we get into your guys' passion and specifics around that, let's talk to Miss Sarah. Tell me a little bit about how you got where you are as well and what drives that passion for you. Well, I'm kind of the opposite of Dave in that I was mostly extremely uncoordinated, always the last kid picked on every team. When I got to high school, I really, really wanted to run track, but I scared the daylights out of my track coach because when I would jump hurdles, I would pretty much trip and fall over every single one. And she was like, please, no. <laughs> But I had another passion at the time, which was training horses. And since I could sit and someone else could do the running while I did the thinking, I was actually quite good at that. I trained horses for a number of years, competed in jumping and cross country and dressage. And I also taught lessons. And that really kind of, even though it was horses and people together, it really kind of gave me a really good eye for movement. What looks good, what looks bad, speed you know, placement, whether, how are those two <laughs> working together to optimize what their goal is? And of course, kind of like Dave, I suffered a number of injuries because horses like to throw you off and do all kinds of nasty things to you. And so at age 21, I had several compressed discs in my spine and I was in a lot of pain. 
And my orthopedist said, well, I could fuse your spine or you could get stronger. And he's like, I'm not going to fuse your spine because you're only 21 years old and that'll limit you for the rest of your life. So he said, get in the gym and stop whining about your back. <laughs> not in so many words, but that's basically what he told me to do. And I did. And I found that the stronger I got, the more capable I was. All of a sudden, I was able to run. All of a sudden, I was able to do a lot of things that I felt limited by in the past. And so that's just sort of continued through my life. And then when I decided to become a trainer, it wasn't because I never thought I was capable. I always saw these extremely fit people that seemed to know way more than I did. Um, I found out I was wrong. Um, after I had all three of my children, I was designing some fitness programs for myself. And, you know, one of the things I, I did before I had kids is I was a biochemist and I studied breast cancer. And just this weird serendipitous thing was there was several who had breast cancer and had surgery and were trying to get back into shape and they'd see me working out and they were like, you know, you seem to be doing things a little differently than the trainers here are doing. So the trainers would typically just try to kick your butt for an hour and make you sweat and be sore, whereas I was actually working for some goals. And so I started working with them and they were like, why don't you get certified? And I was like, me? <laughs> but I actually found that I had that gift of being able to not only inspire them, but, you know, I could look and see what they were doing and say, you know, that doesn't look right. I think we need to change the way you're moving to make this more efficient because I understood what good movement looked like. Mm. And then several years ago, I met Dave and he told me to chain myself to the squat rack and stay there until my squat went up and he was right. <laughs> and ever since then, you know, the guys have been the winners. <laughs> I love that. And I love that in the conversation of your superhero origin story, so to speak, that both of you come from a background of, hey, I was broken and I had to fix it or life wasn't going to be okay for one reason or another. And it's so powerful. And I think that leads me to my next question for you guys. So just to be clear to the listeners here, uh, Sarah is on the Eastern time zone whereas Dave is on the Pacific time zone, yet they are business partners <laughs> with practical strength. So I want to make sure everybody's clear on that. But that being said, guys, what is practical strength? Why did you settle on that as a name? And how does that really bring itself to the foundation of your philosophy that you use to train people? Sarah, you kicked uh, out. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, when I first got certified and I was training people, I was working in a CrossFit gym. And a lot of people have a lot of fun in those gyms and they're, you know, doing high intensity exercise. But I found that there was sort of a central theme missing, which was developing that foundational strength, that foundational fitness. So I actually saw a lot of injuries. I saw a lot of people, you know, with overuse injuries or just, again, with the incorrect movement because they weren't really practicing good movement often enough to do it consistently and also in the way that was best for their body. Because not everybody squats the same. Everybody has limb length differences and strength imbalances and weaknesses that need to be shored up. And so we kind of used to talk a lot about there needs to be some sort of basic approach that everyone needs to take, develop that foundation before you start throwing all the fancy tricks in there. And well, and then trying really to cover up the injury with kinesio tape and then jumping back into yeah, the line, right? Exactly. And, uh, you know, I've trained a lot of CrossFit athletes. And, you know, when we go in and shore up those basic strengths, they get better at what they're doing. But they didn't realize that they were missing that part. Dave's had a lot of experience with that in just the many sports that he's participated in as well. Yeah. Maybe I can get at the heart of the question of why or what and why, which is, you know, really, Sarah comes at these things from a very scientific background, and I come at things from a, sort of a best practices. You know, how do you do X? And I've always been a bit of an autodidact. So from the beginning, my goal is to figure out with anything, like, how can I make this as simple as possible and then no simpler? Just like, what are the minimum number of moving pieces that we've got, and how do we put them together in a way that works? And then we learn as we go, because I think that's the process that everyone goes through. I think people intuitively know how to do more than they think they aren't able to step back and see the basic pieces. So our goal has always been, let's teach people who are already doing this stuff, whether they be training themselves or training others, what are the basic moving pieces? What does the science say on the one side? And then what are best practices that are out there that are just known? You know, there are best practices that come from bodybuilding, that come from endurance cycling, from running, from cross-country skiing, from wrestling. 
there are pieces out there, patterns of successful practice that can be easily and rapidly applied if you understand what the basic moving pieces are. So our goal was to get that message out there because we got tired of listening to people talk about things out of context or especially the frustration people get of constantly, you know, looking at putting the frosting on stuff when there's no cake. And that was a process that was really frustrating to watch. So we thought this is something we can do that would actually be positive. So that was the goal. Yeah. Um, And the, the foundation exactly is basically squat, press, pull, carry. You should be able to do all those things with significant amounts of weight. And the other point of it is a lot of people will favor what they think are functional movements because they think they are more closely related to things they do in their life. One movement in particular that gets a lot of, I think, undeserved flack is the bench press. You'll have people say to you, well, when am I going to lay on my back and push something away from me? Well, that's not the point of the bench press. The point of the bench press is to build an incredibly strong back. I know it's been used as a chest builder for bodybuilders for years, but the bench press is for building a strong back, and a strong upper back is half the foundation of a really strong body, and you need it to be able to not just bench well, you need it to be able to deadlift well, you need to be able to do it to squat well, you need to be able to do it to clean or snatch or carry a heavy load. So that's one of the things that in one way or another we're trying to add to this basic foundation because the more you can load the body, the more of a response you're going to get, not just from muscular growth, but also from the nervous system. And that's what we're really trying to do is highly coordinate the nervous system to be able to handle heavy loads and heavy forces. Gosh, man, I could talk about this definition of practical strength for hours. We've only got a short period of time here, so I won't. But I did want to say that your naysayers about the bench press, they need to come hang out at my house with my three-year-old. And within 10 minutes, we will be throwing him on our backs up in the air Mm -hmm. and or doing push-ups with him on our back because that's just how we roll. So there you go. Very practical and functional movement. You, You dialed in on something there that I'd like to talk a little bit more about in a bit, which is the the concept of a functional movement, because it has been brutalized in the fitness industry, even to the point of, you know, single arm TRX rows while shoulder pressing on a BOSU ball functionally, uh, which is all a party. <laughs> but before I even get there, I did want to ask about the foundational movements that you just prefaced. And that is the idea that there are some foundational movements that the human body should be capable of under pretty significant load, you know, barring missing a limb or something along those lines. Right. So you just named them. Can you tell me a little bit more about those and how you begin to teach somebody how to deal with those things well? For us, it's really simple. We start with a squat, a press, a pull, and a carry because they're the most basic planes of movement that engage a whole bunch of musculature and a whole bunch of your nervous system all at once. And they're the movements that in some form or another are the most directly applicable to other things we do, like run, jump, kick, fight. All of those things can benefit from being able to move more powerfully in those planes. So, you know, a squat is basically a hip movement. You are strengthening the hips and trunk of the body to raise and lower yourself by applying force through your legs. Done right, it is probably the most powerful stimulus. When I can't do anything else, I will squat. Whether that's squatting, holding something in front of you on your back, a yoke over your shoulders, a squat is a, is a raising and lowering of your hips by applying force through your legs. Simple. Pressing is using your arms to push a weight away from you, either horizontally, vertically, one arm, two arm. Pulling is to lift something, preferably a dead weight, but not necessarily, off of the ground up to wherever. Hip height, there's an extension of a pull that you could use a clean or some other sort of movement. But the basic pattern of driving through your back and hips to apply a tremendous amount of force is really simple, which is why you look at movements like from strongman or I suppose even some of the CrossFit stuff. All of the really powerful movements are variations on those themes. We use a carry because it is one of the other ways, especially when you're limited on the three main movements, that you can develop a tremendous amount of tightness and apply a tremendous amount of force through your whole musculature without really hurting yourself or putting joints into awkward positions. It's one of those things that your capacity to do things powerfully and beautifully is strengthened by being able to carry a lot of weight. You see somebody running with body weight in each hand in a strongman contest. That's a powerful movement. Whether it's one-tenth of body weight or whether it's double body weight, it's a powerful movement. And again, applying a tremendous amount of force over the entire musculature. We stick to those because those are the ones that are easiest to teach, and they are the foundation of all strength movements. I have cyclists doing those things. 
I have power lifters doing those things. I have strongman competitors. I have people who just want to look better and feel better do those things. So we use them because they're effective. And one of the important things that we need to talk about here is teaching is always like an ongoing assessment. So demonstrate the movement, have them see what they're supposed to do. Sometimes you need to push them into position. But you're going to see where their limitations are right up front. And one of the biggest mistakes we can make in assessing is assuming that what we're seeing as a lack of flexibility is a lack of flexibility and not necessarily a weakness. Sometimes it's a weakness. For example, when I teach the squat and I have people telling me, oh, I can't get my hips back, sometimes it's fear. They're afraid they're going to fall backward. I'll put a chair behind them. Okay, sit on the back of the chair, and maybe they fall back. They can't balance. And they say, well, I can't do that. I'm like, actually, you can do that. You're just not strong back there. Those muscles are not engaged. We're going to teach them to engage by getting you to squat to a higher level, and eventually we'll get you down low enough where it can be a little bit more effective. But we need to find the right version of the movement that they can do now that we can then progress over time. Right. You know, same with the deadlift, same with a bench press. You know, are we going to do that with dumbbells? A lot of people will tell you they can't bench because it hurts their shoulders. Usually it's because they've been benching wrong. But there are some people who can't do those movements, and so we always will find some sort of substitute. But it's important to kind of work through those and find where their limitations are because a lot of times there, there are workarounds and things they think they can't do or are uncomfortable. We just find a way to do it differently. Right. I think she touched on a piece that I think is fundamentally important, which is in any of those, we start with what you can do. If you're good at paying attention, you can get anybody, no matter where they start, to get through a portion of the movement that even if you're limited to some partial range of motion, it's still a powerful enough movement that's going to be effective. So, you know, one of the key things we do with a squat, we teach people to squat to a box because everybody knows how to sit down and stand up. Squatting is not that much more complicated once you understand how to sit down and stand up correctly. Everybody knows how to deadlift. You reach down and pick things up. We start from a very basic movement and correct over time to optimize things to a movement that we're trying to get them to do with weight. Now, obviously, that's not exactly the way you move in real life. You know, I don't sit down in a chair like I have 600 pounds on my back, but the pattern of movement that comes from being able to do it with 600 pounds on your back means that you're never not going to be able to sit down or get up out of a chair or be in a detrained state or a position where you can't move. And that's ultimately the goal is to optimize your ability to move in all facets of your life. Right. And you bring up two important topics there. One just for fun that somebody recently said to me in a consultation, I'm sorry, I can't squat. It hurts my knees. And then I said, well, how do you poop? Well, you all got to get there, Absolutely. right? <laughs> that's the only thing. Yes. And there's Every no day. difference between that and a squat outside of training yourself to do it under resistance. Um, yeah. And then the other thing that Sarah just brought up, and I wanted to make it pretty plain to our viewers, is the concept that the range of motion of a movement can be limited, not necessarily by flexibility, but as strength as a foundational limitation. Yeah. So an example of that is uh, your gluteus maximus, everybody grab the butt, and your hamstring complex. Those are both responsible for hip extension, or you can think of that as your leg moving from in front of you to behind you. Now, I know I'm preaching to the choir for YouTube, but not everybody knows this, right? And so somebody will say to me, I can't touch my toes. I have tight hamstrings. And then right. we do a squat assessment or a hip hinge, and I find, you know what? Your hamstring's really tight because it's working so hard all the time, and right. you have a lazy ass, really. Like, that's what it is, is that your glutes aren't doing their job. Therefore, right. your hamstrings have to pick up the slap, right? I love that you brought that concept up, Sarah, and, and that you expanded on it, Dave, because many people think of flexibility. In fact, I recently just did a show on this that flexibility is like the foundational thing. Everybody should start by stretching and foam rolling and doing yoga. And I'm not crapping on those modalities at all. But I am saying that all the flexibility in the world won't make up for a weakness in yes. ability to perform foundational movements. And it sounds like you guys echo that philosophy. We, I, I tell people, I tell people that are deadlifting for the first time up to people that are pulling 800 for reps, tightness is weakness. If you can't reach it, it's because you're exposing a range of motion in which your body is weak. We'll strengthen it and it will get better. Absolutely, all those other things are good and great modalities to add or to feed in, but tightness is weakness. It simply is, and it's simply the easiest thing to correct with modest and progressive amounts of strength training. 
Mm. Yeah, and then to take it just to the outer limits of what we really believe, strength really is the foundation of everything. And a lot of times as trainers or coaches, you're going to have people coming to you like, I want this aesthetic body change, or I want to be able to do all these great things. Mm -hmm. And strength not just lends you the ability to exert force, Think about postural strength. Think about just how most people are so tired at the end of the day, they're slouching. Look at runners who, at the end of their race, folded in half. When you're strong and you can hold yourself in more ideal positions, you can breathe easier, you can continue to exert good force, you can continue to work more efficiently. And so that's going to contribute to anything you want to do, whether it's bodybuilding, endurance racing, just looking good naked, like a lot of people want to do. If you want to be able to go to the gym and do these really hard workouts, guess what? You can work harder if you're stronger and everything else follows from there. But if you don't have that basic strength, you're going to start moving inefficiently, which causes injury. You're not going to have a work capacity to do much. You're going to get tired and fatigued easily and you're not really going to get very far. So you've got to build that strength foundation first and then everything follows. Oh, I'm really picking up what you guys are putting down. I'd, I'd like to switch gears just a little bit and talk about the realm of parenting. And I think Dave brought this topic up specifically at the very beginning when he was talking about the different stages of life that practical strength as a foundation really applies. You know, I've made the joke, but it's a real joke about having a toddler in my world. I never know when I'm going to have to sprint toward the road and and keep him from getting run over by a car. And I never know when he's going to jump from the sixth step and say, Daddy, catch me. Oh, crap. Like, ah. And if I'm not strong, you know, that's a back injury or that's a pulled hamstring or insert thing here that could really set me back. But now I'm in the toddler world. You guys are in the teenager world and there are people who are in the, you know, I have grandkids world. So can you talk to me a little bit about how practical strength, and we've talked a lot about the body here, but let's talk about application to life, how practical strength in your purview is practical in the sense that it follows you throughout your life. It's amazing how much you can accomplish with kids with strength. These days, unfortunately, they sit all day in school and they are staring at phones and iPads, see a lot of forward head posture. And so we kind of have this weird dichotomy of kids that are over-specialized in sports but spend most of their days sitting. So you're going to see a lot of strength imbalances, even in your young athletes. And then you have the kids that don't get an opportunity to do any kind of sports. And I started to see this when I was helping out with the presidential fitness test at my kids' elementary school. You know, you have to get presidential in all five categories in order to be presidentially fit. (laughs) And I would see some pretty awesome kids. I saw this little kid came. He showed up in dress clothes and literally dress shoes and ran a mile in under eight minutes. But he was a little too chubby to do good sit-ups or do um, pull-ups. You know, and there was this other little girl I had that was also kind of heavy. You know, she's eight years old. It's not really her fault. She's not the one feeding herself. But again, she did the mile run in in under nine minutes. Again, couldn't do the pull-ups. And I saw these kids get so discouraged because they couldn't be presidentially fit because they failed one aspect of the test. So I asked the gym teacher if I could do a strength class. And what I did is I taught all these kids over the course of eight weeks. I taught them how to deadlift. No, it's okay. (laughs) When they are posturally mature, you can teach kids how to lift with good form. We're not talking about one rep maxes or anything. But I also taught them how to squat properly. I taught them how to do push-ups and, uh, you know, keep neutral spine. Um, I taught them how to do a lot of different just basic strength movements, and then we would play. But every day, we would practice our deadlifts, and we'd increase the weight. And on the final day of class, I'd let them basically go up and wait until form started to break down or they looked like they were straining. About half of my third graders could all deadlift over 100 pounds by the end of that. Pretty much all of my fourth graders could. And I had that one little girl I just talked about. She deadlifted 132 pounds. Wow. And the difference I saw in them after that was amazing. That little girl who used to come in a dress with bows in her hair managed to convince her parents to buy her some running clothes. And she would come and run every day at recess because she said she wanted to be an athlete. And so yeah. those are the kinds of things that can really change kids out look on stuff. But even more importantly, like my daughter takes after me. She was a little uncoordinated. Gymnastics was kind of a disaster. And she wanted to play softball, but she just wasn't coordinated. I got her deadlifting and doing some powerlifting starting at age nine. And she's a pitcher now. She's amazing. And she sort of, I think, (laughs) escaped my genetic (laughs) contribution in terms of, you know, that uncoordination. To be Um, fair, Sarah, it doesn't sound like anybody was teaching you how to deadlift when you were nine. 
<laughs> that, that is true. They were teaching me how to move hay bales, so. <laughs> but um, I would take a totally tact on this. I think, you know, Sarah's had great experience coaching a lot of kids, and I coached fewer, and I coached my own kids very little, honestly, because I was raised in a household where the operant principle is figure it out. That said, I think one of the greatest things you can do as a parent, this sounds a little selfish, but I really believe this, is to absolutely just be yourself. Just do what you're going to do. And if what you're doing is good and principled and works well, so you are out pursuing your goals, you're exposing yourself to failure and learning, you're pushing yourself, you're going after things in a progressive way, your kids see that. And, you know, my experience has been I haven't had to push my kids at all at anything athletic. They just understand that if you want something, it takes work. And work looks like this. Work is fun. But work is work, and it's one of the great things about strength training and to a degree in, in pure endurance training is it takes skill out of it for the most part, and you're just stacking blocks on top of each other until you reach a point that you've gotten what you want. And I think that the mental process of modeling that behavior, letting them see it. My kids come to the gym with me. They see what it is when I'm coaching. They've been to competitions. They know what that looks like. They understand the rhythm of chasing a goal, meeting it, or chasing a goal and failing. I think for kids, that mental component is probably every bit as important as teaching them to, you know, own their body, stand up straight, have good posture, attack things with vigor. I think that mental piece is what you get out of the practice. Yeah, this hearing by YouTube example. Dog really helps my posture, by the way. I've got like <laughs> I did the same yeah. thing to me. You're standing out like, oh, okay, well and, and and Sarah, I just saw you, you're like, oh dang it, I slouched my shoulder. <laughs> so that immediately well, that's one of the things that we spend a lot of time explaining, you know, optimal strength movements are doing that. They are putting you in a posture and a position to attack things and to move aggressively. It's posture yeah. alignment. Yeah, and a lot of core strength as well. In fact, you know, to go back to my geek background, there's scientific study that showed that squats and deadlifts actually stimulate the core just as well, if not better, than just traditional, like, ab flexion exercises. And I used to teach a kettlebell class, and the women that took it would always, you know, be like, why don't we ever do any core work? And I'd say, well, let's see who can do the most sit-ups. And yeah. They could never beat me, <laughs> and I wasn't really doing a lot of sit-ups. I just was doing all this basic strength work, and I was like, the day you guys can do more sit-ups than me, then we will, you know, have a day focused on core, but until then, do what I say. <laughs> so I'm, I'm hearing quite a few things, and I, just for the listener's sake, I, I want to summarize what I heard from you in the idea of practical strength being applicable throughout the lifespan. So first, just hearing from Sarah and from you, Dave, from childhood all the way on, even if you were unskilled and uncoordinated enough to have to ride horses and not do gymnastics, right, Sarah? Oh, yes. <laughs> strength as a foundational ability is something you can teach anybody yes. as long as we're starting in the right place and as long as we have our sights set on becoming progressively better. It doesn't mean, you know, you can walk in front of me and go, I want to deadlift 500 pounds and we're going to get there immediately. But it means that wherever you're starting, we can make you stronger, which is powerful. Absolutely. The second thing that I heard from you guys, and this really speaks to the heart of what I do with my movement in defining dad bod, is that you as a parent are setting an example for the next generation and whatever it is that you're doing, and hopefully you're growing in strength as this conversation should persuade you to do. <laughs> if you're growing in strength, you can also help to foster that growth mindset in your kids, whether or not they're deadlifting at nine in your basement, Sarah, or if they're pursuing their own athletic aspirations outside of that with the just do it uh, go get it, Dave. But that being said, that you as a parent are setting that example and setting that stage. And strength is one of those avenues that really bypasses age and ability and skill and coordination and genetics and all that stuff. This is definitely something that you as a parent can pursue to make yourself better and your kids will see that. Am I hearing that right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Awesome. Uh, the, the last question I had for you, and then I'll let you guys have the last word to the audience because we're, believe it or not, coming up on an hour, which is crazy to think about. This is going by so fast. You guys are great to talk to. The last question I have for you is this is the Defining Dad Bod Show. And so I would love to hear from you guys, especially as parents, both of, of teenagers now because they're growing up so fast. What yeah. does the phrase Defining Dad Bod mean to you guys? Um. I'm going to start, and I know Dave will want to chime in and finish here, but, you know, I think the, the first word, define, is really important because we often think about, you know, when you hear dad bod, you think aesthetics. You think of some tired, old, worn-out guy with a beer belly and slouched shoulders, but you don't have to be 
that, and the answer doesn't necessarily have to be a six-pack ab ripped physique. It can be the guy, like you said, who can pick up their kids and throw them in the pool. It can be the guy who can take his kids hiking in the mountains and keep up with them for seven, eight miles. It can be the guy that's going to the gym with his kid and strength training. You know, you define what your dad bod is supposed to do. And with our approach, there's really no limits. Uh, Dave's training a few guys out in Boston who are all dads, and he's introducing them to a lot of new goals like strongman training, long distance rucking, all kinds of stuff that they are loving and discovering that, wow, I, I have this in me and I can be something other than, you know, what I've been sentenced to here or feel like I've been sentenced to. I mean, I don't know if I can do much more than to add to that basic theme, which is Going back to the beginning, you noticed we both have a bit of an origin story that starts with recognizing you're at a point you didn't think you were going to be at. For me, that was, you know, two knee reconstructions and the inability to walk without a limp for about five years. I think the biggest takeaway I'm getting from your message is that you, one, accept where you're at. Accept that, yeah, there's some limitations here. There are some challenges. But then as soon as you do that, once you're at step one, then it's step two, which is what can I do next? And owning whatever the next thing is, I think it's very easy to drop into a narrative, especially in your 30s and 40s as your kids are growing up, that this is how you're supposed to be. This is what you look like. This is what you do. And I just don't accept that. I don't accept that. I, th I think your your body is, you're, you're, you're stuck with it. it. It is what it is. And you can own it in a way that lets you do so much more. And I think a big part of being a dad I mean, I think, as I just said in the last, you know, your last question is owning that and showing that to your kids that, yeah, we got limitations and yeah, you got some dings, but you absolutely can do more and you absolutely can do, you know, in some cases, amazing and special things you didn't know you could do. And to me, I can't think of a better example to give your kids than you're not stuck with these limits. Kind of, we have a storyline that this is how it goes. It's like, no, that's not the story. I don't buy that story. Uh, the story is you get to keep fighting. And it gets harder, but you get to keep fighting. That's the inspirational part of just defining what you're going to be. You decide. Don't let somebody else decide. Don't let the storyline decide. You decide what you're going to be and then be it, however that turns out. Sometimes it's great. Sometimes you look like a bodybuilder. Sometimes you just look like a guy who can move well. And that is pretty dang good. Well said. Well, we're not getting any younger. You guys give me chills, by the way. Thank you. I appreciate the, the thoughts and, and sincerity of your parenting hearts and your trainer hearts, which is powerful. So the last thing I'd like to do here before I outro us is just how do people get connected with you and what is the last thing you'd like them to hear? Because I know you guys do seminars. I know that you both do training both locally and I think you do some virtual stuff. What can people do to get connected with you? Oh, well, they can go to our Facebook page. We have a email account, practical strength for trainers at gmail.com. That's probably the best way to get in touch with us. Yeah, we do teach seminars and, you know, we just taught one last fall up in Pennsylvania and we basically walk through the, the basics of fitness and programming and coaching, but in a way that we think is a lot more sort of comprehensive and practical than you see in a lot of certifications, just that we take a big picture approach and and that approach always includes treating the individual as the individual they are, figuring out where they are, what are their strengths and weaknesses, uh, what are their goals, and then figuring out how to get from point A to point B. And we've had a lot of success with the folks that have trained with us. They've thought that we kind of opened a window to them that they had not really seen before. And we've seen a lot of them move on to really change their practices in a way that's made them a lot more successful, but also just made them happier as trainers because they really felt like they could deliver what they were trying to deliver all along but couldn't quite figure out. We also wrote a textbook, which we're working on a second edition for. The title of it is Playing the Ball as It Lies, which is, I think, really the key to a big part of our message is like, wherever you are, wherever you're starting at, that's how you have to address everything is from that starting point. And then really the idea of being able to move forward on an individual basis. And, and that's what our focus has been in seminars is to say, look, you already, you as an individual have a ton of knowledge that you're not using in your training and you're athletes or your trainees or your clients have also this body of knowledge. And so how do you practically unpack all of that and get to moving forward? And the way you do that is really paying attention to what's your starting point and then the incremental movements along the way, the little steps. I think that's one of the reasons why our seminars have been really powerful for people is that we're not coming in and telling you anything magical and new. We're coming in and showing you, hey, check out what's in your toolbox. You've already got this stuff. This stuff works. 
it's simple, but when you apply it, it's borderline magic how well it works. And you already know it. You just need somebody to tell you how you know it. So that's what I'd leave you with. Oh, man, again, I wish I had several hours to spend with you guys and maybe another cup of coffee or two, but we're going to cut it off right here. I think it's been a fantastic time. You can catch Dave and Sarah at Practical Strength on Facebook. And as Sarah said, you can also catch up with them at their email. And I'm not going to botch it here. I will put a link below in the description. Guys, thank you so much for joining me today and for the value you offered our listeners. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure.